Okay, it's two o'clock. Let's get started. First of all, I want to thank everyone for joining us today on our fifth webinar of a series of six. We've covered a lot of topics such as, such as issues when you're wide belt sanding, different types of grains, what they're used for, many other topics. Uh, you can see any webinars you've missed at sandpaper.com backslash pastwebinars.com. This one will be on uh, the next day or so as well. Today's webinar is part two of a two-part series on hand sanding. Two weeks ago, Sherry Jessen, our hand sanding technician, and I discussed hand sanding 101, just kind of the basics of hand sanding. Today, we'll get into a little more depth about hand sanding and um, how it applies to, uh, to all the different applications. Please type your questions as we go along. We'll stop somewhere in the middle and handle any questions at that time then, and then we will take uh, questions again at the end. So let's get started. As I mentioned, Sherry Jessen, our hand sanding technician, is on the line with us by audio, and she's going to be very instrumental today in educating us on hand sanding. We're going to discuss opening the wood for stain today, sanding different profiles, discuss sanding between coats, what grit should be used and when, and when you need to hand sand. Regarding the opening of the wood for stain, uh, Sherry's going to tell us a little bit about knowing when to sand before stain, what grits to use, and really important, which we covered some last week, but you can't cover this too much, how to remove swirl marks. Sherry, can you get us started on sanding before stain? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Uh, just a quick uh, little tutorial. We are working on when we sand before stain. And the reason we have to open the wood is because a lot of people are buying the doors out. They're buying from door factories. They're being uh, trucked in and they're sitting on a shelf. And when they sit there, the wood tends to close up. And that causes really uh, some really bad issues when you start staining. You'll start to see pooling. You'll start to see uneven finishes. So it's really important that we open that wood up and uh, just sand it a little bit. Doesn't have to be a lot, but just enough to get it open and the grain ready to accept the stain. Okay, now Sherry, I know there's lots of ways to open the stain and we're talking, or open the grain for stain. And we're talking basically not a product that's just come right out of the wide belt machine or a product that you just finished hand sanding the cross grain. You certainly could go straight to stain, you know, if you're done with it at that point. But if you have to wait around, that's when we have the issue. And you recommend a lot of times a flock back or a Velcro backed foam product. So a sponge basically with Velcro. Why do you suggest that uh, to break the, the grain back open? Well, one of the reasons we, for a long time, I didn't like the flock back foam on raw wood. Uh, it, it tends to recede into the sponge, the grain does, and it usually doesn't give us a really good scratch. We started working with it on um, basically on molding and we found that it did open up the grain and it allowed the stain on the molding. So we started playing with it with the round disc on the sander. Not everyone agrees that the flock back foam will open it up, but it does give us the best chance to open it up and the longevity of that product. It reduces the amount of abrasives that we use in the shop and it also gives us no swirls. So it's, it's a little bit harder to swirl with the foam. And I, when I say no swirls, it will swirl some if you tend to over sand, but it's the swirl marks are a lot softer. They're a lot easier to get out and they are a lot less than if we go to a coated abrasive. If you're gonna go to a coated abrasive, you need to start around 220 grit and it's just a very light sand. It shouldn't be more than one trip around the, I say around the racetracks. And when I say that, I mean around the rails and styles and hit the center paddle and you should be good. You don't want to spend a lot of time. The more time you spend on it, the more chance you have of getting swirl marks. One other question on this, Sherry, if you happen to have a brush machine, can you skip some of this process? If you just run it back through there, say in a 180 or 220, just to bump it back open? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, the biggest, thing is, is that when the grain closes up, like I said, it'll close up and your stain will just sit on top. It'll either pool or it'll, you'll get an uneven, uneven color. And we have to get that, that wood to accept that, that stain. And to accept it, it's got to be opened up. And it's just like uh, cloth. It's going to open up. It's going to accept it better if, if you've got a good open surface and you don't invade that scratch and close it back up. 
Okay, great. Uh, now, and then we've discussed this before, um, as I told people on the last webinar, if, if you were already on here, it's a little redundant, but I saw this for the first time after 25 years of being in this business, a very unique way that if you do have swirl marks left, Sherry, how can we remove them? Well, we discussed, like we discussed last time, swirl marks come in a couple of different ways. One, it can come over off of an orbital pad and it looks kind of like a small fingernail, or you can get what we see here in the picture and that's some pretty deep swirl marks. And that's generally, that looks like probably a sander skipped across the surface as it grabbed. So what we want to do is if we stain right now, we're going to see that whole mark across the surface. We've got to, to somehow knock that down or blend that in. And the, we find the best way to do it is if it's a very deep swirl mark like this, I would go maroon. It's a 320 grit aluminum oxide grain on that non-woven maroon pad. And it, it'll knock it down. You won't see any, any of the swirl anymore. With a, a light swirl mark, like something from an orbital pad, I would go with my finger, you know, like what like, like a finger, I would go with the gray, which is a silicon carbide. It's about a 600 grit grain and it's a lot softer. The nice thing about this, it doesn't change the color of the wood. We've uh, tested it in a lot of different shops. We were up in New York, we went in one and they were, they were blown away by how brilliant the color was, how much prettier the color was after knocking the swirls. And we had really, really tried to swirl it up, held the, the sander down. The one thing I need you need to note is that this cannot be done with a round sander. If you do this with a round sander, you're going to add more swirls, and that's because of the random pattern. For whatever reason, and I, you know, I, I apologize, I don't, I can't answer the question exact. But with the square sander and the fixed rotation, it doesn't swirl with the non-woven pads. It'll just, it'll just take them out and blend them, and you won't even see them. Really good secret uh, here, people. So it's really. Uh... Really good thing to try if you if you run into the situation. Uh, best ways to sand profiles. We're well, Sherry's going to discuss how to sand deep cove moldings, how to sand moldings with small flutes, and how to sand out deep deep knife marks. And Sherry, get us started with deep cove mold sanding. All right. So cove molding has become more and more popular as we start to see more and more oven hoods. Uh, these deep deep coves where you've got to get in. If you don't have deep knife marks, and you'll see that in a couple of slides, you can take a, the three by four half inch and you can go down in there and you can take out a light molder mark or just open up the wood like we talked about a few minutes ago with a three by four with the medium block back foam abrasive. If you've got deep marks, you've got to come back to a coated abrasive. So that's your knives and you've got to get in there and you've got to be able to sand them out. I started using the three by four with a half inch interface pad. Sometimes I need to get a little bit more aggressive. So I'll use a seven millimeter, but I try to stay with the half inch because the more aggressive we get, the deeper we're going to cut in and the more swirls we're going to leave and the more chance we have for divot. So I try to go back to my half inch anytime I can. I usually try to offset a little bit at the, the front of the sander, maybe you know a, a, a half or a quarter of an inch above the front of the sander where it just turns up on the lip because you're gonna rock her down in there. I also like film based, uh, film back products versus paperback. And the reason being is film tends to be flatter. It's a much flatter, I know they say paper, but paper is still, it's a wool, it's a wood that's been glued together if you fibers, you know, and so. We want to go back to something as flat as possible. And that, and to me, film is the flattest option we have. It also, as we're rocking in, a lot of times you'll have some edging that you'll bump into. With paper, you're gonna tear it. If you start to tear the paper on the edging, that's going to, you're going to see it in the finish. You're going to see marks that it's gonna fold up underneath itself or you're gonna lose grain on the edges. And so the film tends to hold its, its edges better and the grain tends to stay in place. So definitely film in that, in that option. Okay, just so folks know, this picture at the bottom left, the white pad and then the black one, that's the same pad actually. That is the half inch. You can tell by looking at the foam in between. It's a very open cell foam. That's great for the contours, as Sherry mentioned, it's gonna contour well. 
the, they, there is a interface pad that's made that looks identical to that with a with a harder foam in the middle and that's better for for flat sanding but just so you know if you're inquiring with this from your supplier and you mention an interface pad there's usually two densities tell them for code molding that you want the softest density that they have uh sherry mold sanding with small fluting this is the uh one that you hate to admit but break out the hand sanding tools. Uh, we just can't get into those small flutes with the, with the three by four. Uh, as much as we'd like to believe that the, the half inch will fall down in there, it just doesn't fall down deep enough to really get in there. Now, if you're not really trying to get in between those flutes, you're okay. But most people really need, cause you're gonna need to get down in there and you want, that's where you want your paint and your stain to sit and you don't want it to ride or to pool right there. So I've, I've gone on the right side of the screen, you'll see a little hand block. I've seen people fold uh, discs together. PSA seems to be the best, you know, they, that sticks to itself and get in between and sand. It's really tedious on your hands. It's tedious on your fingers. And if there was a better way to do it, I'd love to be able to tell you, but the easiest way is to get back to hand sanding. The block does help a lot. And if you notice that Curtis has got that little lip turned up on, that, on the picture on that, and that makes a big difference. If you can fit that in there and get in there with the edge of that block, it will save your hands and your fingers and it'll give you a better sand because we all have different pressure with points with our fingers and our hands. And it's one of the reasons why we try to lean away from hand sanding, especially on fat, flat surfaces. Okay. Sanding deep knife marks by hand. You'll see in that top picture, you'll see the marks from the molder and uh, from the knives. And that's probably got caught in there and it, it kind of tore it up on the edge. Um, I, it's not a great picture of deep knife marks, but it's the best one I had at the, at the present. And for me, you can't do this with foam abrasives. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of people try. I've seen them try the, even going all the way back to a course on the uh, flogback foam abrasive on the tool. And, and the tool gives us the torque we need but it doesn't allow for the grain to really bite into the wood because it does recede even with the five millimeter or the 10 millimeter that we see out on the market. The only way you're going to get this out is to go back again to a, a, a conventional abrasive, a, a piece of sandpaper. We can put it on the tool, but we have to remember, especially on a three by four, that the putting a film tech or film based uh, product on the sander itself, it'll cause it to vibrate and it'll catch and it'll slide across and we'll put a ton of swirls in it. So don't forget that pad saver that's up in the right hand corner. But you're going to have to go back and you're going to have to work those knife marks out with a conventional abrasive. I would say depending on the knife mark, you should be able to start somewhere around 120, 180 but you, it's really gonna depend on how bad that molding is and if it's bought out and, or if it's done in-house. And if it's done in-house, I would suggest maybe looking at maybe sharp, sharpening the knives and see if you can clean that up a bit. But if it's bought out and you've got this, you gotta go back to a conventional abrasive. And the uh, pad savers in this particular picture are multi-hole, those also come plain. You know, ask your supplier for that. They also come in four hole for uh, three by four, four hole machines. And they're also available in five inch if you decide to use a five inch DA sander on this particular application instead of a three by four. Scuff sanding between coats, Sherry. Uh, fill us in about that. And unfortunately, that's something everybody's got to do. Yeah, and it seems to be the bottleneck in the finish room. Anytime you talk to a finish specialist, that's, that's what they tell you it takes the longest is because most people are doing it by hand. In the past, you know, it, we would try to put a conventional abrasive on the sander and do it with the conventional abrasives. And it was usually 320, 400, and especially in sealer, you get a lot of cut through and that's never a good thing because you're going to take it all the way back then. And it's, it's just repeating the same process and uh, possibly doing it again. We find that the best solution for scuff sanding is done with foam abrasives, whether it be by hand or by tool. With the tool, we speed it up and we give you a more consistent scratch. With hand sanding, we tend, like we were talking a few minutes ago, everybody's 
pressure points are different. Our, our fingertips become our pressure points and I may be a softer, I may have a softer scratch than my neighbor next door that is sanding, you know, a little bit harder. He may be a little bit bigger person, so he's pushing a little bit harder. We also, as we're standing there, tend to talk and we may be sanding one direction at one second and the next thing you know, we're going a different direction and we have scratches, it's going all different ways. And a lot of times, Depending on the thickness of your primer and your sealer and your, your paint, you can sometimes pick up those scratches. They're not easily picked up, but they can be picked up by the naked eye. So going back and putting it on a tool is our best option because it's going to give us a nice consistent scratch. The torque's there and the speed is there and we can move through scuff sanding a lot quicker. Now tell us a little bit about the, we refer to it as Echo Silk Plus because there's not a lot of companies that manufacture a, a flock back foam abrasive, but I think it's important for people to understand the grits and um, what we you know, what their, uh, what the actual scratch is going to be when they use this product on a machine. Absolutely. And, and I've always been against putting the actual grain grit on the product. And the reason I am is because people tend to see that and one of two things happens. They look at it and they say, oh, that's too aggressive or two, it's they'll ask for a 120 grit scratch, but they'll get the 120 grit grain because they don't, it doesn't equate. People kind of get confused. The other thing I want to mention is that this grit sequence is for a flock back foam abrasive. It does not equate to a hand sanding sponge. So it's a little bit different when we start talking about scratch and finish. On the Echo Silk Plus, the flock back foam, if you look, we have uh, three, four, five, six, seven different, and I apologize, I should know that by heart, but we have seven different uh, grit sequences. And the first being coarse. The 60 grit scratch, to be perfectly honest with you, um, it's a great product. I've seen it used a couple of times in when we got really aggressive, when we needed to really take back um, some of the stain, not necessarily sealer, but we can take stain off with the coarse. I've seen it used a little bit on half inch on crown molding. It's, it's got a particular niche market, but not as, as big a user as say the medium or the fine, very fine those. The medium in the half inch is where I see more medium half inch than I do anything else. And that is simply because of crown molding. We can open up more, I say crown molding, it could be any type of more door molding, any type of molding. We can open up the scratch on molding, on a strip of molding much quicker with a three by four with a, a medium pad than we can by hand. And it's simply just by running the sander down it. The medium fine is another one that we are working with. And I've actually used it recently on primer and we really found that it was aggressive on a fast moving line and it worked a lot better than the fine it gave us the scratch we need again fine 220 240 kind of my wheelhouse for primer in between fine and very fine again i want to mention this all depends on how much primer and sealer you're laying down if you've got somebody that's laying down a really thick coat of primer, um, I've seen it in like a, a Sheffla line where the primer is very, very thick because the, it, the paint runs right behind it. A lot of times we can't get aggressive enough with a very fine or a fine. The medium fine is where we have to go. I've even seen it go all the way back to medium. So it depends on where, where they're laying down the, the finish. The very fine is, perfect for primer in a small to medium shop. Super fine is where I go with sealer. Sealer is different. We can't cut through on the edges. We can ride the edge with the five mil and all that with the super fine and not cut through. But when we back up to the very fine, that 320 to 400 gets a little, a little aggressive. We do have a question. It's a good time to take one real quick. Uh, so far we just have one and it's from an anonymous attendee here. Uh, what is the best way to measure quantitatively or qualitatively surface finish after sanding? Some say apply stain and see if you like it. Is there a less objective way to assess it? Um, when we run tests uh, in large venues, and Curtis, you can, you can um, kind of maybe 
uh, give me a little bit of help on this one. But when we run tests, well, we do a split part test and we run it just like we would a wide belt. I would say that would be the same thing we would do with hand sanding, maybe not split the parts, but we want to match color. And the color is going to, your color match is going to be at the end. So it's going to be through the wide belt sander, through your hand sanding area. When we get to the finish room, we're going to take our half part compared to what you are currently running or what the standard is. And we're going to put them together grain to grain. And we want to see that our color is matching and we're not variating. With hand yep. sanding, it's going to be similar. Of course, like I said, we're not going to split the parts, but we're still going to, we want to see that we're not changing the color in the shop. I don't know if that's answering your question, but that would be the best way for me to tell you. To and I think best practices is in, in most shops, depending upon how often they run the same type of product, more larger shops that are not doing so much custom, they have very specific colors. So what, what happens there is they, they determine the quality department or owner, whoever is the final say in this, they will run sample parts with what they consider their perfect stain. And that is their sample board. So what I would suggest if you're starting a stain job, yeah, you know, as you suggest that first piece or so that comes out, you take it and you match it up to your board. And there's usually a range, they'll have a, a lighter color and a darker color and you need to fall somewhere there in between. Now, there are all kinds of uh, now computer programs that I mean can dial your color in perfect. They're not cheap, but it's a matter of scanning the color. It, it logs it into the system there and it compares it to, to what it should be in it. Very good systems. It's really taken a lot of the guesswork out of, out of color matching. And as Sherry said, especially on wide belt sanding, we do a lot of split testing where we take your current process, we would split your parts, sand half with the current process. Anytime you make a process change, I would do this, whether it's by hand or wide belt sanding or whatever. Sand with your current process half the part and then sand the other part with the new process. That way, when you're putting parts back together, you're looking at grain for grain on the exact same piece of maple or whatever part, whatever material you're using, rather than trying to compare two different pieces of wood because two different pieces of maple may look completely different. You need to get that grain back together in that case. Uh, also, one more, so I'd like to understand the idea of split part testing. Well, I, I think I just explained it. Um, that's more geared towards wide belting, but again, you can use it in hand sanding. But that's our philosophy when we're testing is we don't want to look at two different pieces of wood. We want to compare current process to the old process on the same exact pieces. So split them, even on a door. I know when you split it, that center panel can come out. So you're going to need to pin it in. Just pop a couple of pins in and it. it's fine. We do it all the time. And that way you can run one half with the old process and the other half with the new. It's the easiest, best way I have seen. Yep. When we put those parts together, we can really, you can really see if the wood was open and what problems we have with any hand sanding, wide belt sanding or anything, we can see the scratch perfectly because we sent it all the way through to the end, all the way through the finish. And, and I see you answered the chat question here about, yeah. uh, so there was a question in case nobody's seen it. So to confirm very fine for in between coat sanding and pigmented coatings and then super fine for staying in between coat sanding and as a share answer, very fine or fine. And she goes to super fine for silver. So that's kind of our rule of thumb, very fine or fine on your, on your uh, primer coats and then uh, super fine for silver. Okay, Sherry, did you right. get, you're done with this one? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, now uh, these are the foam back products. There are three densities, half inch, five millimeter, 10 millimeter, and Sherry's. So we've been over this in several presentations, but if you're new to this, I'm sure he's gonna explain what each of these grits are best used for? The um, half inch has been the most oversold, I should say. <laughs> and when I say that, I don't mean it's not a good product. It's a great product. But what happened was so many people found that the half inch, they saw it, it was so great, it fell in and it worked on moldings and they bought the half inch. Remember that the half inch is for contours. It's not for flat stock sanding because once you start, once you drop in on a flat board or a door, it's going to compress and you're, you're going to close the surface rather than open it because it's just going, the, the grain is just going to compress into that foam and you're not really going to be sanding. It's going to just be moving. On 
molding again, going back to molding, like I just said, the half inch is the best thing I've seen since forever. It'll save you a ton of time and it'll save you fingers. The medium I use on, like I said, opening the wood up. If there's some light molder marks, some dull areas, I can open that up and it takes the stain so much prettier than if I'm doing it by hand. Now by hand, it takes me forever and I'm take it, I may hit, miss, or spot it here or there. With the very fine, I use this on primer. I know everybody's gonna say, well, what about sealer? Unfortunately, it's one of those areas where I can give you 90% of the, the sanding in the finish room I can do with the three by four, the five inch with the flog back foam. That 10%, that sealer, that's gonna fall back in that 10%. We've got to do on molding, you've got to hand sand sealer. There's no way around it. You will, as that foam falls over, as the grain falls over on those sharp edges, it's, it's gonna cut through and there's no way to stop it, unfortunately. And one thing that's very helpful that, that can try to help prevent that is make sure you break your edges well in the white wood, especially if you're wide belt sanding, as soon as you run it through a wide belt, it's gonna sharpen your edges by, by nature. So you can either do that with a brush machine or you can simply do it by hand with a block with coated braces or you can even use like a one inch sponge. But you really important to break those edges. You still risk the, you know, you still have a risk of cutting through, but it's going to definitely uh, increase your ability not to. If you don't break the edges at all, almost anything you do, you're going to get a white line around that edge. Right. On doors, now on molding, just remember, go back to hand sanding. Okay, let's see here. Five millimeter pad, Sherry. Five millimeter flat surfaces. This was the first flat surface pad that came out. The five millimeter is a little bit denser. Um, when I say that, it's if you pick up the half inch, you can feel the difference in the foam. It doesn't allow the grain to recede as deep into the foam as the half inch does. So it's great for surface scratch. Like we talked about earlier, the fine on fast moving lines and on heavy primer is perfect that to me is the best scratch that we can get and it does last the longest one of the nice things about the echo silk plus is like we talked last time that you can blow it out and it just keeps working keeps working keeps working you will you can usually get between 30 to 40 pieces per pad out of a five millimeter or a 10 millimeter pad so if you're using, when I say 30 to 40, you, if you're using a disc, you're gonna use 30 to 40 discs to one Echo Silk Plus pad or flog back foam pad. So the fine gives us even a, a little bit longer with the fine we found, we got up to I think 46 parts the last time we tested it on a 10 mil. So the fine, because the grain's a little bit bigger, the dust can blow out a little bit easier and it gives you a nice soft cut. Very fine on, like I said, small to medium shops. Their, their primer tends to be not as thick. So we wanna go back. We don't wanna take all the primer off. If we cut through a little bit on the edge, we're all right. With the five millimeter, again, as long as what you don't do is shove down on the sander and wrap the edge, you shouldn't cut through. Especially on primer, you should see zero cut through. And as long as, again, you follow the pattern, around the racetrack and the center panel, you shouldn't have any issues with that, with the pad loading and, you know, going over the edges. The super fine, again, I go back to the super fine for sealer. Uh, the sealer is a little bit thinner. We have to be a lot more care careful in not cutting through. So I go to the super fine because it gives me a softer scratch. It still gives me enough of a scratch for the next coat but it does prevent the cut through in a lot of areas. And 10 millimeter, which is the newest density uh, available in the flock back foam. The 10 mil, the grits pretty much follow the same. The medium, like we talked about, is really good on raw wood for opening it up. It can also be used a little bit on swirl marks when you see them. Uh, we'll, the fine, very fine, super fine, fine follows the same pattern. The nice thing about the 10 mil is with the amount of shaker doors that we have on the market today, this drops in and goes corner to corner. 
We don't, we no longer have that mark in the, in the corners where the round sander didn't reach. So we have to go to a hand pad and we have a different scratch right there. We can go corner to corner, drawer boxes. The other area is if you're running a hanging line, the five mil will vibrate when you take the sander to the door in the center panel. It'll vibrate and it'll skip and it'll cause sanding issues. The 10 mil, for whatever reason, acts as a sharper shock absorber and it sticks to the pad. The other thing that I find with the 10 mil is that when you're on the rails and styles, especially on a hanging line, you have less tendency for your wrist to go left or right with the sander. And when I say that is on sealer, sometimes if you're tired towards the end of the day, you'll start to lean and your wrist will tilt to the left. And with the five mil, it'll run that edge and it'll cut through and you'll get a lot of cut through especially on hanging lines. With the 10 mil, it sits flatter and it's harder to make that turn with your wrist. It holds your wrist a little bit in more in place when you're sanding. So I definitely like the 10 mil on the hanging line all the way around. Okay, Sherry, when to hand sand, um, fill us in a little bit on that about stain to prevent the cut through, raise panel profile doors and crown moldings. All right, so like I said, 90% of, of the sanding can be done now in the finish room with a tool, especially with the introduction of the flock back foam abrasive. It's the best thing that I've seen come into the finish room in forever. Uh, but there is that 10% that falls in that we just, we can't, do anything with that flog back foam, especially on stain, we will cut through. And that's the worst thing we can possibly do. So we go back to when we are in those cove moldings. If you've got an extra lip on that cove molding, if you roll up on that cove molding with that half inch pad, you're gonna cut through. You're gonna have a sharp little edge right there. There's no way to break that edge other than you know, to run a sander down it. We really don't, we want that profile right there. So I go back to, I use a half inch pad, two-sided half inch pad. It's the most collapsible. You'll see it here in a minute. It's the most collapsible in my hand. I can shove it in because there's no abrasive on the edge. I can shove it in and sand up to an edge without hitting the edge because I'm not using that abrasive. On a raised panel door, if you think about it, you've got that profile that comes down in where the, the panel drops into the rails and styles. We have to be able to sand that. I've seen people do it with the three by four with a five millimeter where we offset it and we run that edge. But if you rock her down at all, you're going to cut through or you're going to flat spot that, that area. So I go back again when I teach classes to that half inch pad and shoving it down in there and using it with one swift motion across that, that area. And then again on crown molding, same, same concept. You've got some sharp edges. We have to stay off the sharp edges with, a, with the sandpaper. If you get in that or get on that edge, you're gonna cut through or you're going to change the profile in some way. So the half inch seems to be the best to me in contouring through that. Okay. Speaking of That's which. That's the two-sided sponge that we were just talking about. Sorry, Curtis, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. But like I said, this to me, if you look at the sponge, you can see there's no sandpaper on the edge. There's no grain and coating on the edge of those sun sponges. So I can shove that down in any different direction and I can just, it's so collapsible in my hand. Uh, they, they, they just conform really well. I can take it on the edge of a door and run it down the edge of a door and not have to worry about not getting all the way down and not having enough grain to cover it. These also last a decent amount of time. They're, they will outlast a flat pad quite a bit because again, you can blow these out. Don't be afraid to blow these out. They're not going to last as long as a uh, flock back foam like the Ecosilk Plus, and the reason being is because the resin bond system is totally different, but they still can be blown out. And one of the problems that I see is people use them and they don't blow them out and they just throw them in the trash and it becomes a big expense. Don't be afraid to use the air gun on these because they, they will blow out. And there's lots of options anymore with these half inch sponges. It used to be that one in the middle, the black one was about the only thing out there. That silicon carbide does a good job, but it tends to shed a little more. Than some of the newer stuff. The one on the right is a white sponge. 
So kind of the benefit of that is if, if there is any shedding, you wouldn't see it because it's see-through. We do have customers that, that tend to prefer that on lighter finishes. And then we also have a brown one half inch sponge uh, that's relatively new for us um, and probably a little bit, it's probably not so new to the market, but been around a while, but it doesn't shed nearly as bad. And in a lot of cases, it's a good substitute for the white one. You shouldn't get too much shedding to, to get any brown specks or anything in the finish, but there's lots of options with the half inch. So be sure you, you investigate all of those. And I'm all not to, uh, I know we, we try not to sell on here, but I want to plug in the Eka Diamond sponge that we just introduced. And the reason I do is because of what Curtis just said. In the past, there was a lot of shedding that went on with half inch sponges and they would, you would find grain throughout the finish. Even the, with the white sponge, even though you couldn't see it in the paint, if you ran your hand over it, you could feel it in the paint. I do a lot of tests with crunching them up and seeing them over paper and letting people feel the grain that's falling off. And the reason I do that is I want you to see how much grain is being left in your finish. With this new sponge we have, I have done it several times. I've taken it and crunched it up and it's completely, there's, there's little to no grain on the paper. I really, really, and that's it on the right, uh, Curtis. And it's, to me, this is going to change that half inch sponge to a, a whole better uh, solution because the grain that we lose on those half inch sponges can cause a lot of problems. Yeah, I think it's worth mentioning this, this new product uh, to the market. You notice it's completely different. You have these pads of diamond shaped pads that really help flatten out and then they leave a nice finish. And also there's a lot of space between those pads, which anytime you can add space to get some airflow, it helps with the loading which you know, can be a problem with sponges sometimes. So it gives a place for things to load off. And like I said, it's relatively new to the market. So far, testing's been great. And you know, hopefully uh, we'll continue to see that. Looks like we got a couple uh, chat here. Let's see if there's any question on it. I just, I, I'm assuming that he wanted to know what that, that last sponge was. So I just put in Ekadim. Okay. Yeah, Ekadim is what that's called, folks. E-K-A-D-I-A-M-O-N-D. -A -A very, very unique uh, sponge product. I'll have the video to um, our marketing team in the next couple of days of you'll get to see. It's kind of hard to see the, the black and the brown uh, grain on the white sheet of paper, but I, I, I have been working on that and trying to get a, enough lighting to be able to see it so that you can really see the difference in how these diamond sponges work. Okay. No, you got right. a question, Curtis, a chat. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did you say there was one over there? There's one on the chat, I think. Okay. The question here is I often, and it's from Doug. Hey, Doug, how are you? I often sand between finishes when using poly or varnish. Usually they are smaller things I'm sanding. Sometimes it's flat surfaces like art boxes or curved, unusual shape piece like sculptures. What do you recommend for this? Depending on the size, uh, Doug, if it's if it's a small piece, you could do it by hand. And I would, like I said, I would go back to that half inch sponge. Um, if it's, if you do a lot of it though, it would be worth it to invest in the three by four. You could use the, with the flat surfaces, you could get just the five millimeter. If you've got some curved pieces, the best thing on curved pieces to me is a half inch Ecosil Plus. Well, that really kind of wraps it up for that part of the second session of our hand sanding webinar. But keep in mind, we're always looking for um, topics. If you have any suggestions you would like a, to see a webinar on, if you give us that information, we'll certainly look at see if we can put something together. This, we have one more uh, webinar left in our series of six. That'll be, let's talk about solid surface. That'll be July 22nd. So if you're doing much with solid surfaces, it'll be a very beneficial webinar to see. Any questions you have beyond this, Curtis Hicks at Unita.com will be a direct email to me. S. Jessen at Unita.com is direct uh, email to Sherry. And we will be happy to answer any questions we can. If we don't know the answers, we'll certainly try to find them for you. All of our webinars will be posted from now until infinity here to sandpaper.com backslash past dash webinars. So feel free to go there if you missed any, if you want to you know, view another one for a second time, they're there. 
And again, our next webinar will be July 22nd. We always encourage you to go to www.unita.com or sandpaper.com. They both take you to the same place. And we have a great resources center with lots of, of uh, educational articles and videos. So we really appreciate your participation. We feel this series has been very, a very fun series to put on. We hope it's been beneficial. And I'm sure we'll be doing more webinars even after this last one here in a couple of weeks. So thanks everybody for joining. Sherry, thank you for your help. And I uh, hope everybody stays safe out there and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks guys.